One of the most common questions that I get asked is how do we know that dark matter exists? Which is why I've covered it already in a video going through all the evidence we have from many decades of observations. But then occasionally someone will ask, how do we know how much dark matter there is? So you might have seen those astrophysicists talk about this pie chart before, which shows you the breakdown of like the universe's energy budget, like how much energy went into creating each different component of the universe. So you can see that 68% of all the stuff in the universe is dark energy. That's the name that we give to the thing that's causing the accelerated expansion of the universe. We don't really understand it yet. But then you can also see that about 5% of all the stuff in the universe is normal matter. And then 27% of all the stuff in the universe is dark matter. Now dark matter is matter that we can't see because it doesn't interact with light in the same way that normal matter does. So it doesn't absorb or emit or reflect light in any way. But we still know that it's there because it has a gravitational effect on the things around it. And if you look at those numbers again, we can see that dark matter outweighs normal matter by about a ratio of five to one. But how do we know that? Where do those numbers on that pie chart come from? Well, there's many different ways that we've looked at the amount of dark matter in the universe before. And thankfully, they've all given us roughly the same answer for how much dark matter to normal matter there is. In this video, I wanna talk about three of those different ways that we've done this. First, from observing clusters of galaxies to work out the ratio of visible to dark matter. Second, using something called Big Bang Nucleosynthesis. And three, from looking at the cosmic micro wave background. And knowing the history and the ins and outs of the observations and the assumptions we make in just these three different methods hopefully will give you some context when you see new dark matter research articles that are covered in the media in stories like this one which present a research paper as if it's accepted truth that our universe has no dark matter. When in reality this paper was research testing an alternate model of the universe but one that is still incomplete. But thanks to the sponsor of this week's video Ground News, when news like this gets reported on I can actually see all of the sources that have covered this story in one place so I can get a much more complete and diverse picture of what's going on. Ground News is the brainchild of Harleen Kaur, an ex-NASA engineer who even worked on JWST. So of course they have great space news coverage, but most importantly they give the factuality rating so that you can understand the reporting practices of each source. I particularly like using Ground News to stay on top of news that wasn't really reported on that much in my own country of the UK. Okay. Like this story, for example, on the heat wave in Mali and Burkina Faso. With Ground News, I can see straight away using their handy summary at the top there that this was researched on by the World Weather Attribution. There were over 48 publications that covered this story worldwide, but only three of those sources were from right-leaning publications. And this is one of my favorite features of Ground News. They have this blind spot feature that shows you stories that were covered less by one side of the political spectrum or the other. I think this is so important for helping you get like a well-rounded view on on a topic, which is why I'm so excited to be partnering with them again and hopefully help you do the same. So if you head to ground.news forward slash Dr. Becky and subscribe, you'll get 40% off their Vantage plan, which gives you unlimited access, an offer which is only available this month, so make sure you don't miss out. The site is completely funded by subscriptions, which means there's no ads, and that means it's also free of any of the bias that comes with paid advertising in the media. So thanks again to Ground News for sponsoring this video. And now let's start by chatting about the first method on that list, observing galaxy clusters. Galaxy clusters are big groups of galaxies, so islands of stars in the universe that are bound together by gravity. Instead of moving apart from each other because of the expansion of space, gravity holds the galaxies together in this cluster structure, and some of them will fly past each other and interact, and some will even merge together. Now, it was Fritz Zwicky who first thought about how these massive structures of galaxies even stay bound together, publishing papers in both 1933 and 1937 on this topic. Although note how he used the word nebula here, not galaxy, because this was only a few years after people realized that some nebulae, the fuzzy things on the sky, were galaxies in their own right. Zwicky pointed out that if the galaxies are moving too fast, they have so much energy that gravity won't be strong enough to keep those galaxies bound together in the cluster. And if you run through the maths, you find that to be bound together, 
the total kinetic energy of the system has to be less than half of the gravitational energy. And you can work out if that is the case for galaxies in clusters. The first thing you need to measure are the velocities of the individual galaxies. And we can do that using a simple Doppler shift of their light. Then you measure the size of the cluster. So how many hundreds of thousands of light years side to side is this big galaxy cluster? And then you can work out, okay, how much mass has to be there to hold this cluster together as one big gravitationally bound structure. It was in 1937 that Zwicky calculated this for the Coma Cluster of galaxies and found that the total mass to hold it together had to be greater than nine with 46 zeros after it grams, or 45 trillion times the mass of the Sun. And there's about a thousand galaxies in the Coma Cluster, so if you split that mass evenly, that means that each galaxy should be about 45 billion times the mass of the Sun, so 45 trillion divided by a thousand. That's way more massive than a galaxy should be, which obviously we know now, but Zwicky at the time had to get at that information in a different way. First of all, he looked at each individual galaxy and considered, okay, how much light is it giving off? And it's the stars that are giving out the light. So if there's a certain amount of mass, there's therefore a mass to light ratio. And in the Milky Way and like a nearby star cluster, that mass to light ratio is about three-ish. But Zwicky found that in the Coma Cluster, the mass to light ratio was 500. Essentially, there's way more mass there than we can account for in stars. There's mass there that we can't see. Now, Zwicky didn't take into account the fact there's also gas in galaxies and also in the clusters in between the galaxies that we can't see, plus black holes and failed stars and rogue planets that are all in these galaxy systems as well. But even when we account for all of those things, there's still not enough mass there to be able to hold those galaxy clusters together. They technically shouldn't exist and they should fly apart from how much energy they have compared to how much mass we know is there. So to get a proper ratio of how much dark matter to normal matter there is, we observe galaxies in multiple wavelengths of light, from X-rays that can detect hot gas in the space between galaxies in a cluster and detect growing black holes in galaxies so we can put numbers on how many black holes we expect to be there, to infrared wavelengths of light to see the failed stars that only glow faintly in the infrared, or even radio light to observe the hydrogen gas that emits at a specific wavelength of 21 centimetres. With all of that information, we can then top up how much normal matter there actually is and compare it to the total mass of the cluster to find out what that ratio is between matter we can see and matter we can't see at all, the dark matter. But we don't just get the mass of the cluster using the same way that Zwicky did, we can also do this with gravitational lensing. So in Einstein's theory of general relativity, the current best theory of gravity that we have, massive objects curve space itself so that when light travels on that curved space, its path gets bent. So massive objects like galaxy clusters can act like lenses, magnifying the light of galaxies behind them in the background. From how much that light from behind is bent, we can weigh the cluster and find out how much total mass is there. And thankfully, when we get that measurement of the total mass of the cluster using gravitational lensing, it agrees roughly with the total mass that we get using Zwicky's virial theorem method as well. So putting all of that together, the total mass of the cluster versus the amount of matter that we know is there in gas and stars and black holes and planets and dust, we find that dark matter outnumbers normal matter by a ratio of roughly five to one. So that's one way of working out how much dark matter there is in the universe. But what about the second way on this list, using Big Bang nucleosynthesis? That might sound like a bit of a mouthful, but nucleosynthesis, if you break it down, synthesis just means to synthesize, i.e. to make something, and nucleo is referring to the nuclei of atoms. So it just means how are nuclei of atoms made in the Big Bang Theory. And the Big Bang Theory describes the evolution of the entire universe from incredibly hot and dense in the early stages to the one we see around us today with stars and planets and galaxies. So a really crucial step in that whole process of the Big Bang Theory is to create 
atoms, right? Out of subatomic particles like protons and neutrons that make up the nuclei, the centers of atoms. How that happens and how fast it happens very strongly depends on the conditions in the early universe. So how close together the particles were, how much energy they had, you know, what temperature they were, and how likely they therefore were to collide. And so you can model for this happening. Like how likely is it that when two particles collide in the early universe, will they bind together like one proton and one neutron to make a deuterium nucleus? And then if they collide again, how likely is it that they'll make a helium nucleus, which is two protons and two neutrons? And again, how likely is it if they collide, will they then make a lithium nuclei, three protons and three neutrons? It was Ralph Alpha, Hans Bette, and George Gamma who first did this calculation in 1948 in the famous Alpha, Beta, and Gamma paper, and found that if you start from the prediction of how much deuterium, helium, and lithium formed in the very early universe, and use that to make stars, which then themselves make even heavier elements, you can match the observed amounts of each element in the universe. They predicted that 25% of the mass of the universe should be helium, with 0.01% of the mass being deuterium, and an even smaller fraction being lithium, and all of the rest being hydrogen. But to get these fractions to match what we see today in all of the heavier elements, you have to set what's known as the baryonic fraction i.e. how much of the universe's energy budget has gone into creating baryons, also known as normal matter. And if you do this and you get everything to match from what you get from Big Bang nucleosynthesis, you find that the amount of normal matter in the universe is about 4 to 5% of the universe's total energy budget, which is not enough to account for all of the mass in the universe. Once again, normal matter is outnumbered by dark matter about five to one. And finally, let's also chat about the cosmic microwave background. Because this is the method that really lets us fill in all of this pie chart, the dark matter fraction and the baryonic fraction, the normal matter fraction. Now the cosmic microwave background is the oldest light in the universe. So when the universe finally expanded and cooled enough that electrons could then be bound to those nuclei to actually make atoms, light could free stream for the first time. The universe became transparent and the first light was emitted. That happened when the universe was around about 380,000 years old and it occurred everywhere in the universe at the same time so whichever direction we look we can see that light because light takes time to travel to us at the fastest speed there is. So we observe it across the whole sky and then we can flatten the inside of that curved sphere that we've observed down onto a flat page and we get that egg shape that you see all the time in all sky astronomy images, whether it's taking invisible light or microwaves, like for the cosmic microwave background. So what you're seeing when you look at an image of the cosmic microwave background across this whole sky is an echo of what was happening in the early universe, with bluer patches showing where the universe was ever so slightly cooler and redder patches showing where the universe was ever so slightly warmer. Now these different temperature fluctuations were due to the different densities in the early universe. The light traced where the mass was, but crucially, it only traced where the normal matter was, because that's what light interacts with. It didn't trace where the dark matter was, because light doesn't interact with dark matter. So the cosmic microwave background is imprinted with where normal matter was in the early universe. But as the universe evolved, the dark matter dominated in terms of the gravity, which meant how the normal matter evolved actually traced where the dark matter was, with galaxies of stars forming where the dark matter was densest. That means that the structure of the universe on large scales today traces where dark matter is. So from comparing these two different things, we can build a model of the universe which evolves from the cosmic microwave background and where all the normal matter was then to what we see in the universe today in terms of where all the normal matter is now tracing the dark matter. And so this pie chart is essentially the result of this best fit model that we have to that data. If we actually look at some results from the European Space Agency's Planck mission that studied the cosmic microwave background, we can find that matter makes up about 31% of the total energy budget of the universe. And again, if we look at that ratio between normal baryonic matter and cold dark matter, we find that normal matter is around about 18% or just shy of a 5 to 1 ratio. 
So there you have it, three ways to work out how much dark matter there is in the universe that all roughly agree. I say roughly because there was the small issue of something called the missing baryon problem for a while there, where that first method of galaxy clusters found less normal matter than the other two methods suggested. But we think we finally figured that one out now and found where all that normal matter was hiding. So let me know down in the comments below if you'd like another video on that. And of course you can now send this video to you know anyone in your life that happens to state that they think that dark matter is a bit sketch so they can understand understand how all of these different and individual observations of the universe all point to dark matter's existence and not only that but also agree on how much dark matter there is in the universe. But then occasionally someone will ask how do we know how much dark matter there is? How much is that dark matter in the window? Oh, God, I didn't know where that came from. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I, do, I do know where that came from. That's, it's two days at the pub is what it is. Like, do you think I'm going to have to put his tweet over the top of a bit sketch? Or is it, you know, just blindingly obvious who I'm talking about? 